Remember playing dress up when you were young, engaging your imagination together with costumes, props, or even a cardboard box that became a helmet, a mask, or a fort of some kind. Make believe enhances our creativity and often builds the bridge between what we experience and how we feel and offers the opportunity to express those feelings and our curiosity about our world through play. Provocative theater and arts education are mediums that provide the underpinnings of learning more about people in the world. Our featured organization sets the stage, literally, for young people and their families to have meaningful conversations about important issues that build character by actively engaging in and teaching many of life's lessons. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at Reach Us at the Intrinsic Group. 24th Street Theater began its story in 1997 in a building with a rich history of its own, a 1928 carriage house home to working horses of Victorian houses in the neighborhood. The karma of the carriage house, or the wisdom of the founders, or maybe a little bit of both, influenced what 24th Street Theater is today truly a community in every sense of the word, offering theater productions to bring the community together, but also engaging younger audiences by offering free online after-school arts programs known as After Cool Program and Enter Stage Right. 24th Street Theater has continued to foster this neighborhood community engagement philosophy and approach by launching Teatro Nuevo, bringing more Spanish-speaking audiences and a consciousness and intention to delivering a cross-cultural component to the theater and to theater goers. Their goal is to engage, educate, and provoke young people and their families with excellent theater and arts education and to be recognized as a leader in theater for young audiences influencing the field to be more adventurous, more sophisticated, and more provocative. I am so excited and so interested to learn more by introducing you to my guest today, Executive Director Jay McAdams, Artistic Director Debbie Devine, Divine, I knew I was gonna mess that up, and Associate Artistic Director Jesus Castamos Chima, and as John Lewis said, good trouble. So let's dedicate this podcast to the good troublemakers. Welcome, Jay, Debbie, and Chima. Please share your passion about the 24th Street Theater and your deep connection and commitment and what led to your involvement. Jay, Debbie, Chima, whoever wants to jump in, just introduce yourself first and get going. Hey, Laura, it's Jay. Thanks for having us. You got me all excited with that intro. We're in our 24th year and... <laughs> yeah. and uh... You know, our big piece that we're so proud of is is our relationship with the community that we built. Uh, because most theaters, you know, most theaters are in the business of doing plays solely. What we realized early on in landing in this in this neighborhood around USC in back in the nineties was that there was a real opportunity to to help people yeah. and to do more than just plays. So that's kind of become one of our taglines is more than just plays. And we love plays, we're theater people. Doing plays when we landed in this neighborhood all of a sudden didn't seem like enough. I loved, Laura, how you brought my favorite words into the conversation, which is make believe. As opposed to movies and television, theater by its very nature is an art form in which we agree, the audience agrees, the kids agree, the adults agree, and the actors agree that we're all making ourselves believe this. We know we're not going into space when we do a space scene, but we're involved in our using our, you know, in our imagination. We're very much about deconstructed theater. We do very little props. A big emphasis is pantomime. We'll, if we'll do a, a play, it'll have maybe five props in it, lights, sound, live music, critical. But really, the imagination is just a, a vital part, a foundational part of our core value and mission. Say more about that, because I, I want to learn more, too. So we would never do a play with a kitchen set or a couch. Interesting. It just wouldn't happen. So it would be a couple of boxes or the last piece we did, just scaffolding that we put wheels on and, and it became 16 different places. We did the wow. miraculous journey of Edward Tulane because it really was about 
using your imagination. And I'll tell you, being a nonprofit, you really have to use your imagination to stay yeah, it's alive. It's good on the budget. This, it's good, this it's good on the budget. Yeah. Kids say after, the adults say after, oh, you know, that was just incredible. I, you know, I, I saw that doll shop mm -hmm. and there wasn't a single doll in it. I then we know, we know we've done it. Yeah. We've landed that sure. part of the brain and the heart and the soul yeah. that is the essence of what theater is all about. And you know, a big part of children's theater in general tends to be eye candy, you know, because you want to dazzle the young audiences. And so the design, you our, know, the, our competitors. We're talking. Okay. Well, I'm talking about the field in general. We're a bit of an outlier. And, you know, this is why we joke about being troublemakers. We tend to do more black box kind of theater, which really you think about more in the kind of the young, you know, college mm -hmm. circuit, kind of experimental, roll up your sleeves and let's get dirty kind of art. We apply that for kids. We'd rather do, you know, a single actor sitting on a stool and just completely carry them away mm -hmm. than to have, you know, a fully uh, dressed stage with a million blinking lights on it to yeah. achieve the same right. thing. I've worked um, in radio, working with uh, Susan Lowenberg in LA Theater Works, and, and just to be able to, as we were talking about earlier, using just uh, radio, audio. Mm -hmm. We're taking that same philosophy and putting it on the stage. In terms of content, we're talking about things in our arts education programs, which is being done today, you know, post the George Floyd movement mm -hmm. and the Black Lives Matter movement. But, but a year ago, to be talking about racism in arts education was a bit a bit dangerous. Right. We've been doing that for decades and sometimes having to couch it as, hey, look, we're talking about theater. Really, the content is about racism. Right. right. But we're talking about the lights and costumes, right. you know, right. for educational purposes. Because we serve urban kids and they're sophisticated and they're smart and they need to be honored. And what we're doing is we're showing them the world and then we're helping them remember there's hope Mm -hmm. and resilience in it. Chima will tell you too, his work with um, our teatro community has the same philosophy and the same goals. All our stories are written from scratch, you know, based on the stories of, you know, um, I'm talking about Teatro del Pueblo. Mm -hmm. Most of our plays come from their stories as immigrants in mm -hmm. this country. You know, another thing that I wanted to say when, you know, during the introduction, you said cardboard boxes. It just made me think about the way I started dreaming about doing theater because that's what I, you know, I am from a very small village in Mexico, you know, only 300 people. And uh, that's the way I started, you know, creating you know, with a cardboard box and my toys, I started creating stories for my sisters. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do at 24th Street Theater. You know, we want people to dream about it and we help them to work it out. And so they become reality. I absolutely love that. Certainly my kids and certainly I played with boxes and my kids even, I think, more than I did because there were a group of them and they kind of got into it with each other. But I love that because it can be anything you want it to be. And then it can change in a heartbeat. If your desire changes, the scene can change. And so you're really creating that space for folks to enter in and use their own imagination. You give them sort of a part of a journey and wherever they take it and go with it is connected to their own journey, which I really, really love and appreciate. And I also want to comment that you're gearing this toward younger audiences with messages that are adult in so many ways that they can take in. And I love the concept of hope and resilience because we all need that. And if something is given to you, you don't integrate it and internalize it in the same way. So you're actually doing a public health service. That's what I want to tell yeah. you. We feel like we are. I mean, we've, we've been trying to get playwrights who write adult theater uh, to write for young audiences for years. Uh, and, and we've had some success. And then we've had some that say, look, I just yeah. need that audience. It's not interesting to well, me. Well, they don't honor the kids the way we know and have learned to adore them and appreciate their, their minds and their capacity. That's the big difference. The US also has a lot of gatekeepers. Equity, the union is a gatekeeper. Presenting houses are gatekeepers. Parents, Schools, parents are gatekeepers. It's so the, the troublemakers that we are, are always pushing that envelope. We're always, the, you know, the content is, can, is about death or loss or racism, struggles. That's scary. You know, a teacher doesn't want to feel like, oh, I brought my kid to 24th Street Theater and she came home crying. 
Yeah. But she came home crying because she felt something. I think it's so important because those experiences kids have and to see it in an outside environment actually helps the child or would have helped me as a child, right, I'll speak right. for myself, to realize that I'm not alone. This actually happens right. and it right. is sad and I need a place to talk about this and hopefully with my family. Right. Whereas if everybody's trying to deny the existence or placate it with a candy and lights and sort of the rest of the, right. you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. There's a lot of sense around protecting children. Of course, we need to protect of children. Of course. It's a, yeah. But when you have a structured story, an actual place in which feelings are expressed mm -hmm. and, and empathy is uh, out there and they feel that and they express that and then teaching them how to regulate those feelings. That's brand new in the world of education. We've been doing it for 25 years, but educators are just right. learning, oh wait, it's good to express themselves. Right. Called social emotional learning is in the yeah. vanguard of it. Theater has the structure, the strategy to help them navigate feelings, not just deep breathing or yoga. And, and not just watching it uh, and experiencing it as, a, as an observer, but to experience it themselves as artists, uh, we be, feel is a strategy. One right. of the things we've been doing uh, recently during the, during the pandemic in this last year is working with one of our partners, the LA County Office of Education. Mm -hmm. We've been working with them for years, but in this last year, we've been really focusing on this social emotional learning that Debbie's talking about and training educators across the county and state hundreds and hundreds of them already, how to incorporate this into your regular classroom practice I and use it. it right now. I mean, talk about suicides. You know, Clark County, Nevada, uh, in this past school year has had 18 suicides. The youngest was a fourth grader. Ah. So, you know, there's an epidemic, kind of a pandemic within the pandemic right. of, of student suicides in this country. So trying to get the mental health piece mm -hmm. back on the rails is, is crucial. And we have been really lucky that LACO's brought us in to be trainers of this for the education community. So and we're also lucky that all of this is online now. So that's just serendipity and the good luck of being able to talk to the entire state, to multiple counties, which we wouldn't have been able to do if this hadn't happened. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> thank you, Internet. In Teatro del Pueblo, the way we started this process of creating a new play is uh, we, we normally have these uh, story circles in the beginning, everybody sharing their stories as immigrants, you know, coming into this country. And um, you don't want to be there. Yeah. You are crying all the way for two hours, you know, that we stay there because everybody you know, they share their stories. You can look at them as uh, tragedy and tragedies, but they are success mm -hmm. stories because, of course, they went through all that, but they were they were there with us. You know, and now they're working, their families, and somehow we we become like sort of a therapist, a uh, psychologist. <laughs> but but what I appreciate more is that they feel that they are in a safe place. They come to our theater and they feel like they can say whatever they want because he's going to stay there with us and we're going to do art with them. You've kind of created a sense of home. I want to add one thing to what you had said earlier, which is it's not only allowing them to process their own feelings that they may not have been able to find a place to do that, but it's also building empathy because once you observe witness, you can then be much more empathic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably true with the circles. Hearing other folks' stories can also make you think about your own and create some compassion. Absolutely. Yes. I, I want to take a step back. I want to know how each of you got involved. Well, Debbie and I uh, came as a unit. We were married already by, uh, by the time we started 24th Street Theater. Uh, with a couple of USC uh, partners, John Weitzbunner, Stephanie Schroyer, were our other two co-founders back in the 90s. And it came through the dean of theater who wanted a professional theater in the neighborhood. Bob Scales was the dean at the time. He's the one who kind of wooed us to come down and check out the community around USC and introduced us to our landlord and showed us this great old warehouse. And that's how we came as a you know, as a, yeah. as a unit. You know, I feel like a missionary around it because for me, I didn't speak when I was a kid at all. Really? And was very, very shy. 
and my sometimes I wish we could go back to our childhood. <laughs> I, now, as, this is not you know couples counseling, but we can go there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm so my mother, I mean, yeah. this is you know 1900. Yes. My mother enrolled me, you know, in a in an acting class when I was 11. It really, I mean, it was transformative mm -hmm. to be able to make myself believe and find that. Yeah. And then I realized that my job was to share that with other people. Yeah. And I just started to, you know, experiment with it, learned a little bit, was a history major at UCLA, but was really just dabbling in it because I, it gave me so much. And I was working in a non-public school. So this was sort of the, the epiphany of what happened to me. I was working at this non-public school, really troubled kids. This kid showed up and I'm teaching this acting class and this kid shows up and he's really angry and won't come in the door. You know, and I said, come on in. And he said, you know, bite me, fuck you. you know, <laughs> do, do, and, yeah. and he leaves, but he comes back the next day. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, learning because that's what you do. Hey, invite him in. Come on, come back in. No, no. Third day comes back standing in the doorway. Doesn't speak this time, but stays there and watches us. Mm -hmm. Fourth day, yeah. I say, hey, you're back. Come on in. And doesn't speak, but comes in and starts to play and is transformed and he transformed me and and that's the actor and musician jack black and because of that experience because of seeing his power the power of what it did to for this specific kid and all the kids i were was working with and they're not all lucky to be to turn out to be jack of but course. just it was just like here's the message debbie Here's the message. Arts education and art and acting is is a portal to self-confidence and beauty, yeah. power and creativity. And acceptance, self-acceptance first and then acceptance, yeah. which is what you're talking about. And exactly. I want to I give a little kudos to your mom. Yeah. Because honestly, because I don't think that is a natural, you know, it's more berating, like, why aren't you speaking up or you need right. to, whatever it is. And right. so- she found a natural outlet for you that yeah. grew into this blessing for many others. Chima, um, how did you learn about 24th Street? How did you get involved? When I was in my Thomas mom, uh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I started doing this when I was 18 back in Culiacán, Sinaloa. And then uh, I moved to Mexico City to, I wanted to become a, a professional actor. So I ended up working for the National Theater Company and then I moved to Los Angeles, just thinking that I was gonna stay here only for six months, studying English. Mm -hmm. But then I met my girlfriend, so I decided to stay, and I started looking for the, you know, theater everywhere. So I did several things, you know, all over Los Angeles, different companies, and uh, a lot of community work and plays and uh, movies, short films and things. And one of my friends, he knew Jay, Alex um, Patino. He recommended me to Jay, so I went to see him, and um, that was funny because uh, you know after an hour, after we have talked for an hour, that what surprises me was you know this uh, brown guy in front of this white guy, he didn't know me at all, yeah. and it surprises me that he gave me the key of the theater and he told me this is your theater, and I was like what? I, he he messed me up, really, <laughs> because by doing that, you know, the only thing I can do is to to comply with everything they wanted from right. me. You know, like I was like committed. To that the, was the strategy. Do, do yeah. And I've been like, handing out the keys ever since to everybody. The mailman comes, I give him a key. So he said, you're gonna be the, you're gonna be in charge of the Latino program. At that time it was called uh, Teatro Nuevo. Teatro but Nuevo. Now we call it the Teatro del Pueblo, which has been one of the best learning experience in my life. Working with these non-professional actors taught me more than what I can ever teach them. And this, I really appreciate it. Talk a little bit about that. You know, by listening to them, I can listen to so many stories because every story that they tell me, I go back and I can find my family, my friends, all these things. And so I started, you know, having this empathy, this um, connection with them and uh, make me more sensitive about what people go through when they come into this country to really understand 
that journey, that tragedy, if you want to call it, you know, because they they have no choice. They need to come into this country. It wasn't my experience. Right. That's why I didn't know exactly, even though I heard about it. But now listening from their own mouth, it made me connect with them. And of course, I always try to, you know, like help them at any way I can, you know, yeah. to, to go through this life in here in America, yeah. here in the United States. You're giving them an experience that they're observing, but they're part of. And so it helps them with their own feelings about whatever they're going through. And at the same time, it's creating empathy so that they really start to understand what other people are going through as well. You're a living example, Chima, of what this theater is about. I have to go back to one thing, Jay. What was it about Chima that you said, here are the keys? You know, it's funny. I've never done that with anyone else. And I wasn't aware that I had done it in this instance. It was a few years later that Chima told that story. <laughs> and I said, wait, I gave you the key after an hour? Did I do that? I kind of fell in love with Chima. You know, he's like a brother. You know, you said at the top of this as we were getting ready to record, well, you know, I feel like you know, we're old friends. Mm -hmm. Well, that was kind of the kismet that happened once we started talking and Chima was telling me about breaking up with his girlfriend recently. And, you know, we're theater people. I mean, what, you know, the, the thing about theater people is that you, you wear your emotions on your sleeve. There's good and bad with that in life. <laughs> it makes things chaotic sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you get to the heart of a theater person. I assume that's why I gave him the key. I'm wondering, too, if because you're both in the same field, there's, as you said, you wear your heart sort of on your sleeve, but I think that embeds trust. Initially, mm -hmm. if you feel it, you don't second guess yourself. We've traveled the world together. We've taken our shows to uh, Central America and South uh -huh. America and Mexico. All people, over the US. People in this program that Chima is talking about, people who were gonna get divorced, then did not get divorced because of it. People got into therapy because of it. I mean, people have better relationships with their children because of the empathy they've, they've felt. So it's, it, it's, it was a good decision to give him yeah. that key. Tell us about some of the programs you offer. You mentioned them and I opened with a few, a few names. So share with us some of the programs and what you offer and how it works. You know, a core value that wouldn't be defined necessarily as a program, and we always struggle with this with foundations, but if you've seen our space, it's Faces 24th Street Theater, and they are giant, big accordion carriage doors. They open to our lobby, and they are always open mm -hmm. when we're there. Anybody that promenades, walks by, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a graduate student, a homeless person, a, mm -hmm. you know, a merchant, they tend to kind of wander in there. And we keep coffee. Always coffee in the is lobby. always yeah. brewing. So a homeless person comes in, needs a bathroom, a cup of coffee, a place to sit and be safe for a few minutes. That's so what we've had we've had does. hundreds and hundreds of people that have never seen the programs that you're talking about, Laura, but have experienced us as um, you know, caregivers and artists and you know, kind of the little yeah. church on the corner there. So right. we call really our cool open door. door Mm -hmm. a program because it does take a lot of our time you know throughout yeah. the yeah, all the staff is up front it's helped us become a pillar of the community right, because we right. are a go-to place and it goes back to that word laura that you talked about with jay and chima the the, the community trusts us some yeah. of our other programs we have in-school programs uh we have one of the best field trip programs in the entire city in fact nobody in the country is doing what what we're doing we've kind of reverse engineered this very exciting arts ed program that just has had 100,000 students on the edge of their seats and, and teachers. Uh, so that's called Interstage Right. You alluded to that. We now have a virtual program. Debbie has taken that online in the last year since uh, the pandemic and school has been online. Completely reworked it and came wow. up with this great recipe that Again, LACO, the Office of Education that oversees 81 school districts in LA County, mm -hmm. saw it and said, holy cow, this is like, you know, nobody's engaging kids like this. And we developed a little technique we call breaking the glass, where it's like reaching through the screen and just grabbing them, you know, and shaking the excitement right into them. Right. So that's a huge program. And then we have after school programs for our inner city kids, for our local kids, free after school programs. Thousands of kids have done that uh, over the last 20 years. 
Uh, then we have a teen leadership program that works with high school kids, Love teaches it. them job readiness, college readiness. When it's job readiness or college readiness, is it through the frame of storytelling exactly i, I, I love this because it's, exactly. honestly it's not threatening you've created entry points for needs out there that is completely non-threatening and yet intensely vulnerable but for everybody who's there those teens then work with our younger kids and role it. model and mentor and, and then we them. give them hands-on training we teach them to do job interviews we have them put on a a nice uh, pair of clothes and come in with a resume and sit love down it as yeah. when we do mock job interviews. And then we pay them to participate in the programming. And we do professional development and we've been talking to you about it, professional development for teachers and administrators. And that's a program we do nationwide. And we do professional theater for young audiences, which is always um, super title Spanish. So we always have the super titles there. So they're accessible to our community. Yes. And then our day of the dead, which is, I mean, it should be, that's the only thing we do. Day it's, of the it's dead. It's gotten we, so big we, and it's hard. It's so big. It's 5,000 people, two council <laughs> districts, a supervisor district. We shut down Hoover from 22nd all the way to Adams. And if you know LA, that's, yeah, that's a, a lot. lot. When I told Jay about this you know i said jay let's do a dia de los muertos festival and he said what is that i tried to explain Don't to him friends. and he said oh that's, that's halloween no it's not halloween right. it's totally different it's totally not different. halloween yeah, it's, yeah we and, nothing. but, but let, no but listen to this you know uh, you know talking about trust i told jay let me do it and i remember that time there was no, you know we didn't have that much money and he said you know we only have 500 dollars. that's what he told me the first festival it was made uh, with all my friends you know like yeah. dancers uh, uh, painters uh, um, uh, actors and we okay. did this and we called the community we talked to the community and they came to sell their you know the tamales and all these things that they mexican uh, antojitos that they do you know every time they have a party or whatever they brought it into our festival so they sold it and uh, we had, you know, and it was amazing because we had like 500 people. But they saw the potential and after that, you know, they said, okay, let's invest more in, into this. So right now we have more than 5,000 people in our festival. So, I'm and so we so close cool. the intersection and it's- uh, 5,000 people and a Ferris wheel. Chima, did you start this when you first came on board 15 years ago? And it's been going ever since. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Yes. Uh, wow. I think it was the, yeah, it was the first year. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Do you imagine when hopefully COVID-19 dissipates and we're vaccinated or it's something that isn't so high risk, do you imagine continuing a sort of hybrid? I don't know if you have the capacity. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah tell me more about that. Because you can reach so many more people. Jay and I are doing a professional development with um, with five um, counties next Wednesday. Oh, and literally right. do a school field trip for any school anywhere now. They don't right. have to be in right. LA. And we used to be able to only do them, you know, for 99 kids. Now we do them online for 300 kids. Yeah, it's amazing. And we figured out how to make it personal and intimate with 300 kids. So we're yeah. absolutely going to keep that going. That's amazing because that's a huge challenge. It's a different animal. It's not the same. It's right, not just doing a play in front of a camera, doing a class in front of a camera. But That's you can okay. make both work. So we hope to have both. For Teatro del Pueblo, we decided yeah. to start a storytelling uh, workshop. And because I told them, okay, you're good telling stories now, you're gonna write them. Some of them, uh, because they were afraid of doing it because they didn't, they never wrote a, you know, like only a letter, maybe to their families, you know, to yeah. their countries. But uh, I told them, yeah, we're gonna learn how to write those stories. Some of them, they, you know, they have only basic education, right. but I told them, guys, you have the sensitivity, just write. Now everybody wants to be part of it. Now, this year right. we started with, uh, we hired uh, one of my friends who is uh, a professor of uh, study of, of art. He's talking about the study of art from the from the Egyptians all mm -hmm. the way up to the modern art, times. Uh, teacher and of art his, history, yeah. Yes, right. exactly. And, and everybody's excited about it. You know, I was afraid because I thought, oh my God, these guys haven't heard about all this uh, vocabulary and all these things that, you know, are complex, even for me sometimes. Sure. But they are very excited. If this guy is pretty good. My friend is pretty good. Sometimes it takes a lot of time in one painting just to create a story around the painting and they get very interested in it. One of the our the members, she's like almost 80. 
<laughs> and she called me just to tell me, Chima, now I think about different when I go to, well, I'm gonna think different now when I go to a museum. Before right. I used to see the picture, now I see a story behind it. Right. Now I try to explain to myself what the painter wanted to say. To operate as, a, as an artist, a big part of it is your intuition. And obviously talent, the wound that we all need to have too, but, but intuition. And we intuited, Jay and I intuited, that we needed um, videographers. Mm -hmm. We needed editors. We needed graphic designers. We have a huge team in that way, yeah. which has allowed us to take all of these programs that we're talking to you about, uh, Enter Stage Right, the yeah. writing, Teatro del Pueblo, Day of the Dead, and, and make it really beautiful for online viewing. This is not our wheelhouse. We're theater right. artists. So having right. video artists and editors has been just a, a huge boon. And then the serendipity of having them team members, then this happens, is a big reason why we were able to just get everything online and have it look so great and have it be so accessible. Teatro del Pueblo program started with a two-year grant about a half dozen years ago. Right. And at the end of the two years, I said to everybody, well, thank you. It's you know, we did two shows. It's been a great thing. And bye. And they were like, well, what about us? Yeah. And we realized, oh, man, we got to keep this going. And this is right. not about a grant project no, anymore. No, this is about the community. So it's, it's right. been going on our own dime ever since. It's worth to mention how, you know, the idea of studying this, um, this program, it was to build a bridge of communication um, um, between parents and kids. You know, the kids that were uh, taking classes in our theater, mm -hmm. we wanted to give the experience of the stage to the parents so they have a, like a common ground to talk about during, right. you know, dinner or whatever. And we should give a shout out to our colleagues at Cornerstone Theater uh, because they, you know, they, they kind of created this model decades ago, bringing non-professional uh, people in to do theater just kind of kind of your your average person off the street. I think that's part of the community planting a seed and seeing where it grows. Right. And that's how we learn from one another. But I love um, Chima also what you said about it's it's an avenue or a bridge for parents and kids. And so I it also helps me understand that when you have kids coming into a program and they may be bilingual, but the parents may be really Spanish only in some Correct. situations. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah, about half so, our parents are in that right. column. Yeah. So you want to be able to have that accessible piece, which you talked about in terms of the translation piece, and then also a program that is built around the immigrant experience, whether from a Spanish speaking country or not, that immigrant experience, you know, opens doors for people and how they think about their their own experience and um, both the, the tragedy piece that you talked about, but the the also the journey that they're on and the success that they're having and you're um, adding to that. Just thinking about that, that connection, just how um, vulnerable our community felt when Trump was in power, because they were. I mean, there were ice vans in the neighborhood. You know, you're down there. Yeah. And it was, you know, those doors being literally open were symbolic. They were real yeah. and they have always been. What can we do? Yeah. Fact, what can we do for you? In fact, yeah. at our Dia de los Muertos event, um, mm -hmm. you know, it has been getting progressively bigger each year. Mm -hmm. 2019, I guess it was. We had three council members coming and making speeches and all this stuff. So there was a little more um, police presence, a little more security. And we were concerned. It was right in the heart of all that ICE, you know, business. Some of our families had had uh, family members rounded up at work, you know, went to work at some factory in the morning and were carted off and they, you know, didn't know where their dad was or whatever. And we said, we're really concerned about our community. What happens if an ICE van pulls up? And they guaranteed us, they said, we will stand with you. There will be no ice van pulling up and we will protect your people. You know, we took some comfort in that. And again, it goes back to trust, the trusting relationships right. that you've created within the community. Your doors are always open and that it is scary and alarming when the outside environment is shifting. You've been there a long time. And right. I, so it's really admirable. And it's I love that your doors are not currently, but have historically and will, they will be soon. Be open. They will be and soon. I love that. And I um and I think that that speaks beautifully 
of the expansion of what your mission is really about. It's really about serving the community way more than a theater. I can tell this, you that uh, right now. policy, uh, you know, has um, some risk because we are committed to to take care of whoever comes into our doors. And so I think the second year, we have two homeless. There was a black guy and a Latino guy came into our, the, you know, we were, we were rehearsing and they said, we want to be part of it. We didn't know who they were. Actually, one of one of them, the, the black guy, was was drunk. And I said, well, okay, come back tomorrow and we'll see. So they came back. They were part of our show. They yeah. feel because I was committed to make them feel successful, that yeah. they have achieved something in their lives. Yeah. So eventually they did it. One of them, now it's like doing castings for, for doing movies. And for me as, as a as a director to take the, these two guys all the way to yeah. our opening, you know, and be part of our show. That was, that was pretty That's, That's an amazing story. And I have to say, Jay, I'm so glad you gave Chima that key. <laughs> I, what you honestly- The door turned out to be the key. Oh, I mean, that story in and of itself, it really speaks to the culture of the 24th Street Theater in every sense of the word. We realized early on that we needed to be an oasis, mm -hmm. you know, and when we came in the 90s, it was a pretty rough neighborhood. It was pretty scary actually in the 90s. You know, that's where the coffee idea came from that, you know, let's put it right next to the door. Let's keep the door open. We'll greet yeah. people. I mean, it was counterintuitive. We'll give tours. When right. People here's, come this, in. here's what looks like a dangerous neighborhood. Let's open these doors all right. the way. And we made our lobby into an art gallery. So right. if, I mean, if you just walk by, you would look in and you would see that there was an art exhibit, you know, right. that looked like a real gallery. And then Chima said later, hey, let's put flags. Mm -hmm. international flags in our lobby so when people it. buy it's just a little wink to them that hey you're welcome here nothing of this could be possible if we didn't have this leadership to be honest i just want to say i have to say it because of these uh, risk takers you know because they trust me of my craziness you know sometimes i just you know propose to do things that uh, might look crazy and but they trusted me they said okay let's let's see what happens and you know, it was so, that same door that led us to understand the kids in the neighborhood because right. we were back in 97, I guess it was, we were setting up the, the place and we were literally on ladders in the theater, hanging the light grid up in the rafters. And the front door was open to the street and a kid, an 11 year old kid came and he stood in the doorway and he was just backlit by the sun. We could just see his silhouette. And he hollered in, hey, what are you guys doing? And we said, we're building a theater. And he said, what, what's that? We said, you know, you're gonna come here and you'll see, you'll do, see plays. Will there be beer? So <laughs> Debbie and I climbed down off our ladders and we walk over to the door and we're talking to him and we're trying to explain. And, you know, he couldn't get the concepts. Like, will, will there be dancing? Right. Well, sometimes it'll be in a show, you know, actors. Will there be a different show every day? No. And we realized in talking to this kid mm -hmm. that, cause we had been doing children's theater you know, on the West side for the prior decade for rich kids. Mm -hmm. And we realized, wait a minute, these kids need us in this neighborhood. And, and it was that, that exchange that really told us that we needed to be much more than just a theater. Drove, and that, our, drove our mission. And that kid, his That's name was day. Victor. He never saw a play at our theater, but he lived right across the street from our theater. We got to know him well. Mm -hmm. He has spent most of his adult life in prison for various things mm -hmm. he's now in his 30s mm -hmm. when he gets out he generally comes and pays us a visit and tell us he loves us it is very moving and it's you've again you've created an opportunity to be a uh, a safe haven for your community members i love that and you're right about that theater is a scary thing to do and even to attend sometimes. Yeah. So it really is a combination of a safe space and a brave space. Oh, I like that. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not trained in social work the way you are, but we do very much consider ourselves social workers. Oh, no, you know, in, was... in the arts, through the, yeah, arts. through the arts. We consider your field and our field as completely very related. Much so. Oh. Even though you're trained. <laughs> <laughs> I actually want to commend you because I think the human connection and the humanness and the humanity 
at which you approach everything that you do, it comes through. And I think the other, the fact that Victor can come back, loves you, feels it's a safe haven, you've created a space of true acceptance. We never know what's going on in someone's life, but here's a space of acceptance. And yes, this is what we do. We put on theater and we have these programs. It is never passive. So even if you're in the audience, it is right. not a passive experience. And that's what makes you so unique and different. How do you choose your plays? How do you rework them? How do you contract for them? How does that part work? We're doing a, a play with the Wallace in uh, collaboration with the Wallace, okay. which I'm really excited about. Right. In Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills yeah. in September. We've turned to a playwright who writes specifically for theater for young audiences. And he's, he'd written a play uh, about Rapunzel, the classic story of Rapunzel. And I read it and it, and it felt like it wasn't sophisticated enough. It was Rapunzel and mm. I wanted Rapunzel. So I contacted him and said, uh, Mike, Kenny, we, we love your work. Will you, could we commission a play and will you collaborate with me on it? Love and it. he was so open and so generous that for the last year we've been collaborating on on this that we're really excited to be able to share. It's set in 1944 in London during the war. Yeah. And it's a child who has to leave the city because of the bombings. It goes to a farmhouse and oh, and no. discovers who she really is there. Love in a different way and courage in a different way. She's a I mixed race that. character. How she handles who she is and how she discovers who she is. Just beautifully written. And I have been deeply proud to be able to collaborate with Mike and with the Wallace on presenting this. And we're doing two, two versions of it. We're going to do an audio version in September and then a staged version in April. So we're really excited about it. So we reject most of the children's theater plays that people send to us <laughs> because we're looking for a hybrid. We're looking for something an adult would come to alone and love it, yeah. but that a kid can absorb the main thing. You said something earlier, Laura, about you know kids being want to be treated like adults. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so what, what our formula is, is to do that very mature show that most people would come in and go, that, that's not children's theater. Uh -huh. And we would answer, well, we think it yes, is. Yes, it is. <laughs> because it's, you know, now we wouldn't show kids all theater because everything's not appropriate for, you right. know, a seven-year-old. Right. You don't right. want to horrify and traumatize them. No. But you can talk about right. death and you can talk about greed and you can talk about the you loss. know, the, the big uh -huh. things that matter. Uh -huh. If a play doesn't matter, uh -huh. then let's not waste anybody's time with it. Uh -huh. It's too hard. It's too expensive. And frankly, we're just getting too old to do plays that don't matter. We want to only do right. things that matter. So we've carved out a genre that doesn't exist, which yeah, is children, just... children's theater for adults. But we need to be able to make them laugh. We uh -huh. need to be able to make them cry. And then we uh -huh. need to be able to make them laugh again. Right. Like Debbie said, it's not small stories about people in their kitchens with girlfriends and this and that. No, no, no. It's got to be big. It needs to have magic, mind-blowing. How could this story happen? The subject matters that you talked about, like loss and race and empathy or lack thereof, exist right. within their young lives anyway. Right. That the other things that shouldn't and don't are reserved for later on in life. And exactly. I understand that. But without that early uh, exposure in a safe way, as you all pointed out, Chima included, about including the family and getting the family involved mm -hmm. is such a fabulous formula because it puts it in an objective context mm -hmm. that the family can discuss without discussing maybe what's going on in their own family. Exactly. Necessarily, like right? We just lost our pet or we lost this. And this was something in the play about loss and loss triggers other losses. Right, right. And so just to be able to have that conversation is rich and it allows a child not to to be treated like an adult, but to feel included because their feelings matter. I'm going to use your... Well put. Yeah. We consider yeah. ourselves Pixar. the Pixar of live and it's theater, the, the, not the Tarantino. That was perfectly said because I think Pixar has done a good job of taking topics that are children focused. And of course, Tarantino, who we can love as adults, is absolutely not, not appropriate, appropriate for kids. That sequence in Up, you know, that cycle yeah. of life sequence. Who didn't cry during that yes. sequence? 13, 14 years ago, we had a play. Um, it was a children's play, and you know, like the kind we do. 
and um, there was a scene between you know little there was a girl and a, and a little boy and the little girl that the girl was in love with the boy and so she got a condom she said oh i stole this from my grandma from my grandma's bag so and, and what is that it's a balloon it's a balloon <laughs> but you know the the but the, the adults call him condom when they were leaving i <laughs> It was the end of the play, so they were leaving, and one of the kids were, were, was asking, you know, his father, Dad, Dad, what is a condom? Right. Didn't you hear? It's a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't you know? That's what it is. But I want to comment, uh, because the response of the father that it's a balloon is I think there are times with our children where we just give them enough information that yeah, they're satisfied right. with it, and then when they're ready for more, we give right. them more, and that's what you're creating. Small and Gutsy is sponsored by The Intrinsic Group, my boutique management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes, and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. We'd love to invite you to be a sponsor. So if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at the intrinsic group.com. So now to my quick and gutsies, if you guys are okay with that. What is at the top of your wish list for 24th Street Theater? However, the answer cannot be money or funding. For me, longevity. I oh. want to be I want to be as old as USC. I want these kids and their grandkids to come back to that building and say, you know, I took classes there, I saw a show there, and now you can. Longevity. Yeah, I think that would be mine too. I think it is really hard, I mean, because of all the stuff we've just talked about, to summarize who we are and what we do, because theaters don't do what we do. I mean, we're, we're literally feeding two disabled seniors from the neighborhood during the whole pandemic, taking them to doctor's appointments. I mean, mm -hmm. that's crazy stuff for theaters. We, theaters yeah. aren't in that business. And we just found ourselves in that position right. and saw first. the need, and there was no one else to fill the gap. So we're stepping into that void. But, you know, I'm sure many consultants would pull that apart and say, why, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not your mission. Jay, let me get, put a word to that because you already did it. Doing, continuing to do what matters. Keep the magic. Uh, keeping uh, full houses, in yeah. a way, is pretty much the same. That would be longevity. Laura, there's one of my favorite quotes about magic. This is about magicians, but it applies to us, I think, mm -hmm. so much. Is that the word... Uh, illusion mm. is is trying to figure out how the trick was done mm -hmm. but magic is how you feel yeah. while you're watching it mm -hmm. and I really I really love that magic is a feeling mm -hmm. you know and that's what we're trying to always convey so yeah when we were talking earlier about deconstructed theater yeah. you know if somebody gave me three million dollars to to do a play I I wouldn't know what to do with it because it really, we're not saying that on this podcast. Please, <laughs> we'll find out. Figure, figure it out. out. Yeah. But it we'll wouldn't figure it out. It wouldn't go to costumes and props and sets. Bingo, bingo. But that's an important thing for listeners to understand: is that money that you do get really goes into your programming. It really exactly. allows you to do more for the students and for the families. Exactly. And the Hire more teaching artists. Right. Right. That's what we right. do with it. For instance, right. we have a scholarship program to help. Uh, schools underwrite their their field trips. Yeah. USC is one of our funding partners. Thank you, for USC, neighbor, good neighbor. Nobody pays anything. Oh, it's that's a, free. It's a great business model. I mean, we yeah. don't charge for anything. Amazing. You know, it, it's accessibility is way up. We actually hate money. Our joke, <laughs> our, our joke at the theater amongst the staff is, oh, we hate money. You know, don't give us money. <laughs> we hate money. <laughs> you, you do need it. It's an yeah, evil that you have to meet in this yeah, world. It's a, you know, listen, I've come to learn that it uh, resources are so important, however you acquire them, whether it's money or in kind or a whole bunch of other stuff. And so the fact that you do great work brings the money, brings the funding. What makes your organization gutsy? This is, after all, the Small and Gutsy podcast. What makes your organization gutsy? Well, we deliver content to young people and young people's hearts and minds in a pretty sophisticated way. And it's it's we are not risk averse around that. We get out there and and get ourselves in trouble sometimes around it, but stand firmly that we respect uh, children's capacity to 
experience a story and to um, and to come out stronger on the other end, the catharsis and the resilience and the hope that they get from it. For me, it's the neighborhood that we landed in and that experience with Victor in the doorway. What being in our neighborhood forced us to do that, that day when we realized, wow, these kids aren't, this is not like birthday parties for kids kind of neighborhood. What are we gonna do? We, we realized we had to focus on, on human need, yeah. not start with an idea for a show we right. had to start with the idea of what do people need yeah. and then how can our art help with that? And then the irony is, just the way Chima talked about earlier, what we didn't know we needed. Yeah. That we That's needed exactly those right. connections. We needed that love. We needed to understand another culture. Mm -hmm. We needed to, you know, be able to wrap our arms around the children in, in our neighborhood. We needed that. Yeah. And so we learned and <laughs> we've, we, you know, obviously have gotten so much more than we've given. Pretty much what Jay and Dev said, but with an accent. <laughs> what is something that outsiders or maybe insiders don't know about 24th Street Theater that you maybe haven't shared already? I now know I can come there and stop by for coffee when doors are open. That is true. So that I do and know. good coffee, too. Yeah. We put cinnamon in our coffee because we use cheap coffee. <laughs> Doctor, you're not supposed to say I'm The only person, and mostly we get, wow, this is so, so great. Good. How do you do it? it was, the actor <laughs> Shelley Berman, remember Shelley Berman? He was the only person who's ever said, what, who, who puts, there's cinnamon in that. What, what are you thinking? <laughs> what makes you think I would want cinnamon in my coffee? Every theater does this, but for us, it's a, it's, it really is a religious ritual, is we never leave at night without the ghost light lit. Mm. You know, as tired as we are, you know, all day we're coming, it's 11 o'clock. One of us will bring it out and plug it in. And, you know, and we've got skylights so that we can teach with natural light and, and close right. them for matinees. Mm -hmm. You absolutely could come back the next day and there would be light if you, you know, if you came back, you know, at 11, there'd be light through the skylight. But for us, the ritual of having the ghost light just yeah, means- Explain that to our listeners. I love that concept. Somebody's always home. I mean, think about a theater. Have you ever been to a theater with a window in it? The answer is no. And the reason is because we need to be able to black it out completely. We need to be able to direct your eye because unlike film, it's just you sitting right. there. We have to show you so where to look. Because we teach kids in the daytime hours, that is so depressing. And the walls are always black and the floors, but everything's black in a theater. So the skylights are a way that we can bring bring life and love and warmth in right. you know, during the daytime. But the ghost light is that tradition of you know 2,500 years of our art form that we feel tribal about and honor. For me, the secret would be, you know, I always think of the Wizard of Oz and the man behind the curtain. Yeah. We have created in our 24 years, and it's our 24th anniversary, by the way, and it's, I don't even know how we've done it. We've just lucked out somehow and created a really beautiful uh, organization, magic and beautiful. Yeah. And, and there's only a handful of us, just like with your podcast enterprise here, a few people doing a lot of work that matters. And so I, I think that's kind of the secret. From the street, if you walk in, we probably look like a well-moneyed, well-funded, well-peopled organization. Yeah. Really, we're pretty grassroots. We're pretty small. We're dancing behind that curtain really, really fast. fast. <laughs> <laughs> But hopefully it looks bigger than it is, yeah. you know. And that's, and that's commitment. I don't think outsiders know how much attention and work we put into details when we are doing our shows. Even a single small detail, we rehearse it. Sometimes I get tired of it. I said, Debbie, please. But do you know, like, oh, no, one more time, one more, 10 times, 20 times. Debbie, that's it, that's it. <laughs> we want to make sure that everything works to 100%. Of course, we know, you know, we have accidents, you know, but but that we cannot control. But uh, whatever we can control, we rehearse it to 100%. For us, this is showing respect for our audience. Uh, Laura, we have a, uh, Debbie doesn't know this. Uh, we have a show called Eyes. So when we uh, we had a trick that you know the bumper falls, uh, you know, like during the show it has to fall. Mm -hmm. So from an ice cream uh, truck. So we had the set piece is an ice cream truck. Yeah, we had a trick and it it, it, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And Debbie said, you know what, we are not doing it. But Debbie doesn't know me <laughs> yet. Uh, you know what I'm what I do. So we left. 
I spent the whole night at the theater. I came back to the theater. Mm -hmm. So the following day, I said, Debbie, now it works. Wow. Show me. Wow. Oh, did it 20, 10, 30 times. It worked perfect. So we kept it. I love it. So yeah, but he forgot his lines because he was so tired in the performance that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, something's got to give, you know. Yeah, but the bumper fell off. The right bumper right fell off. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have, we, I think the, the really, the, the, the only thing that we really did intentionally that we did right for these 24 years is we knew early on, you know, we're small, we're grassroots, we have no money, nobody knows us. We cannot do crappy work. Right. And, and that's not just our plays because there are critics in the house. That's it's our everything. after school programs. That's our, our classes for five-year-olds. Because if, if we do crappy work, mm -hmm. we're never going to, get off the map you know it's going to be hard enough if we're brilliant so you know kind of like the ginger rogers thing about i did everything fred astaire did but backwards and in yeah. heels well <laughs> exactly. our our motto has been quality 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 so much so that like chima said sometimes it has literally made us sick you know mm -hmm. and exhausted mm -hmm. but it, it is in hindsight in these 24 years it's the one thing that i i don't have regrets about that i think if you come to see a little kids after cool class at our theater, you will, as an adult, if you sit in the back row, you'll walk away going, that felt like a show. I should have bought a ticket. Mm -hmm. oh. And I'm really proud of the quality. And I, I think people would be, in, generally, in general, I think they'd be shocked to see what the quality of all the work, our teacher classes, our field trips, our, our you know, we don't have the B team that does that work. Mm -hmm. We have the same artists that we do in our award-winning plays. Even with a Spanish production, we are, I think we, we are the only company in Los Angeles that had won the best production of the year with a Spanish production among more than 300 English speaker company. If you could get one celebrity or influencer to endorse or talk about 24th Street Theater, who would it be? Right now, my choice would be Amanda Gorman. I think Fantastic. she speaks so well to our kids. She actually graduated from the school when we moved here. I had still school-aged children, and one of my sons was in her class. And I oh, remember wow. seeing her at graduation. She spoke at graduation. And I remember turning to my mom saying, this young woman is amazing. Well, for me, Laura, it would be you. And it would be you because you would give us the kind of credibility that we're claiming but can't. So somebody that's really in your field that says, I can see the synergy and the Venn diagram between what I do and what is happening in that space, and it's critical and every kid should experience it, it would be you. I'm going to do it for you. Hashtag me. No, I'm going to I'm going to do my best and continue doing it. I Thank think you. this is as much as I can extend and expand awareness and networks for the folks I interview. And you are um, a perfect example, particularly in the field of psychology and social work and the combination thereof of building the next generation, which is a big part of what you're doing. Yeah. is remarkable. Chima, what about you? I, don't know, I think about two. I think about Moliere and I think about Dario Fo. I like when you know you teach through comedy because I think laughter is the best remedy for whatever problems we have. And I think those two are pretty good at doing that. Laura, a few years ago, Debbie and I were in Paris and we went to Moliere's theater and we were in the gift shop. Ourself. I was talking to the clerk as they were ringing me up who spoke some English, recognized I was a an American and started speaking to me and I said yes well we have a theater in Los Angeles you know it's our 10th anniversary and he said oh we're 400. <laughs> the Moliere was one of my I did take French in high school is one of my favorites. So. You know, we had Edward James almost by the way at our Day of the Dead who was talking so about lovely. his roots okay, in I East say. LA and I love him. you know also a, a great voice for our community to hear what a what an activist what a champion he is an amazing amazing oh. man and I have to tell you I have um, met him through other circumstances his advocacy for youth He's is amazing. just tremendous
how can folks uh, reach you? How can folks reach 24th Street? We're pretty Florida? easy to find. Uh, our website is www.24thstreet.org. Great. And where are you actually physically located oh, on 24th Street? Yeah, 24th and Hoover, right up the okay. street from USC. You can see right. it from our corner by the 10 freeway if you're in, in L.A. But I really want to thank you all. Oh, this has been you. an inspiring... We had a great time. It was amazing i learned so much from all of you i learned about the theater i feel like i learned about you personally and what drives you i, I thank you so very much for spending well, thank you thank, thank you, you for, for taking the time me. and and promoting what we do i learned so many things from you and i think you are very good at what whatever you're doing <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening if you like this podcast please share it with your friends give us some stars and write a review on apple or wherever you listen to podcasts or buy us a coffee buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy here's a super long shout out from Cha. Small and Gutsy, the podcast created by my close friend, Dr. Laura Whitkoff, has opened my eyes to so many situations and organizations around the country and the globe whose missions are to help their constituents and to educate others in order to have a real impact in the communities they serve and beyond. Thanks, Chai, really appreciate that. And in addition, she says, the organization showcased in each podcast very widely in subject, though their common goal is to inform and to help, whether their roots and their stories are, for example, in the realm of drug addiction, hearing loss, or better mental health through anime. Their common thread is that they are all nonprofits and social impact organizations with revenues under $10 million with a goal for helping build a better world for all of us. Thanks, Cha. That means a lot for both listening and recognizing the value of the small but mighty network. I really appreciate that. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, my co-producer, sound engineer, and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. Our blog of these small and gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, investors, and donors to this small but mighty network. Of course, we can take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff, and thanks for listening.